So, Eric, um, it's almost uh, six o'clock in Japan. So, how has your day been so far? Uh, my day was good. I uh, got up and went to the gym. And then I had a, just a two hour recording of uh, some kind of internal company promotion training kind of thing like that. And then I came home and had a nice uh, smoothie for my meal before being here and i'll have something after that so n nice easy day how was your day well uh it's only started i just woke up <laughs> <laughs> so good so far i haven't i haven't woken up this early since school which is like a month ago now what time is it there it's 10 o'clock a.m and this, this is yes. the earliest you've woken up <laughs> in about a month <laughs> wow yeah. Anyway, I'm going to start off with um, your fir the first question. So, you are an American, raised there and everything, and you moved over to uh, Japan. So, why of all the countries did Japan sort of uh, make you want to stay there? Um, I had met some Japanese people when I was growing up in California. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I, I, I like the food. And I studied film in university, and that was my major. And I like Japanese cinema and Japanese theory, film theory and things. And um, <clears throat> when I graduated university, I decided to spend 10 years traveling around the world, finding interesting things to make documentary films about, But because I, I never really left America. So I thought I'll just you know, be Indiana Jones for 10 years and just travel around the world. And um, I wanted to go to someplace very different. From my first country and japan was very different and uh, it was <clears throat> the bubble economy at that time in japan so the yen was very strong and they were looking for a lot of english teachers and i heard the work was really easy to get so i sold everything i had <clears throat> which gave me about 300 bucks and my parents bought my plane ticket for graduation present and i just jumped on a plane came to japan with one suit one carry-on bag no job, no hotel reservation, no, no language skills or anything. And I thought I'd spend two years in Japan, <clears throat> uh, save some yen, which would travel well in like India or China or Thailand or something. And uh, came here and started teaching English on my first day. I needed to you know, get money to pay rent and food and stuff. And so I did that. And then two years, you know, I didn't save up that money after, much after two years. So I thought I'd stay a little longer. And in that second two, like third or fourth year period, I uh, started doing voice work. At the time, I was just teaching at like high school and university and college and a little bit of TV and radio. But um, I started doing voice work after about my third or fourth year, fourth year, I think. And I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. And I was feeling comfortable, <clears throat> you know, with my apartment and friends and and job I had a new cool job and i was kind of feeling relaxed and kind of like it was home so i decided to stay and that initial two years turned into 35. gee and counting and counting so basically the the voiceover work and everything else sort of kept you in japan yeah yeah i think if it was just like teaching english i would have just just been so bored <clears throat> that uh, I would have left probably or found something else interesting but because I do like Japan but um, the voice work you know was interesting because every day it's a different job <clears throat> every day you're in the studio like today I did some just in-house uh, promotional video training for a company really boring stuff <clears throat> um, but then sometimes it's games, sometimes it's uh, educational, sometimes it's animation, sometimes it's a uh, public announcement. You know, every day is different. And so that's interesting. And it pays a lot better than teaching as well. So that's fun. And I don't have to wear a suit. You know, I can dress just jeans and a shirt, you know. And um, if I don't want to work, I can take a vacation whenever I want. So that's nice. But it's freelance, which is always rough because you don't know where your next paycheck is coming up. So, uh, you know, it's a gamble, but fortunately for me, it paid off, and I'm I'm happy with it. Yeah, it definitely has, because now you're in so many 
quite iconic games. One that most people would know you for is Shenmue 1 and 2. Um, how did you get into that, and um, what was it like working on all those characters like Ren and whatnot? Uh, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Uh, like any job, you know, it goes through your agent. I have many different agents that I use. <clears throat> and uh, Sega just contacted one of my agents. And they, you know, contacted all, all of their many voice actors that they represent. And they gave them a voice sample. And I guess Suzuki-san liked my sample for, uh, for those. And um, they just hired me, you know, and just said, okay, I, would you like to work on this game? It's they, For Shenmue, they said, you know, it's a big game. It'll be many days of work. And I'm like, sounds good to me. And uh, so I started doing that and just loved it. And, you know, like anything, <clears throat> the characters are what they tell you they want. They usually give you a, a picture sometimes. And they say, this guy is kind of like this character or this kind of personality. And then you just kind of give them a few samples of a voice. And then they, you kind of zero in on what they want, a little faster, a little higher, a little lower. <clears throat> and then you're kind of inspired by certain things. Um, for me, like for Shenmue, I did three characters. Uh, Fukusan, <clears throat> Fukuhara-san, uh, is just a nice guy. And they said he's kind of soft and nice and very gentle. So I just kind of tried to be gentle and nice and, then I was talking like this, and, and you know, he said, Ryo, be careful, you know, come back to us in one piece. You know, they said he's just a soft guy. So I gave them different bits, and then they, they said, okay, yeah, that's what we want. And then for Guizan, I just thought of him as being like, uh, kind of like a Chinese Clint Eastwood. You know, and he just doesn't open his mouth much, and he just kind of speaks like this. And I just kind of spoke through my teeth a lot. And that's Guizan. And then Ren was kind of a a hard one in a way, because I wanted to give him a, some balls, but also a little craziness, you know. <clears throat> and uh, and I kind of came up with this this idea that it was like the two jacks. And I, I wrote this down. I mentioned this to somebody before. And like, um, you know, Kurt Russell in Big Trouble in Little China. Great movie. I feel like I and he plays Jack. <clears throat> Yeah, Jack Burton. He drives a drives a big old semi called the Pork Chop Express, and he's Jack Burton, you know. And he's like, yeah, I don't care, whatever you want, just do it, you know, and <clears throat> that kind of guy. And then also Jack Nicholson. I didn't want to make him just kind of a rough guy. <clears throat> I wanted to give him a little flavor too. So Jack Nicholson kind of comes in at the end, and that's kind of the little crazy side. So I kind of start off. With like Jack Burton, and then when you end the sentence, he's kind of like this at the beginning, and then at the end, he's a little like this. So I found that with Ren, he'll say like, "Yeah, I don't care where you're going, just make sure there's some money," you know. So he starts off Jack Burton and ends up Jack Nicholson, and then I got, I'm like, okay, now I got it, now I know who he is, and uh, they liked it. And so that's that was the birth of Ren. Yeah, you did really well anyways. The Shenmue games is one of the most influential games of all time. I don't even think you know it, but at the time it was the most expensive <laughs> game to ever be made. I heard that at the time, yeah. It was in the Guinness Book of World Records, yeah. As the most expensive video game ever made at the time. Well, there you go. And... Um, yeah, so uh, you got a bit of a fan base from it, and you were definitely called back for uh, more work for Sega, like um, uh, for Virtua Fighter, for example. Uh, only recently were you called back for a, a bit of uh, Jackie Bryant voices. Yeah, Virtua Fighter was great. Um, did about, I think I was in seven or eight different versions of that at this point. Um, <clears throat> you know, all the different, like, Virtual Fighter 4, Sega Superstars, Virtual Quest, Fighter 5, Sonic and Sega All Stars Racing, um, Dead or Alive 5, Ultimate, Dead or Alive 5, Last Round, <clears throat> Ultimate Showdown, and you know, things like that. So I pretty much only did voices for the first one or two, and then they just kind of kept using the voices. So, uh, but I'm always happy. I like, I like uh, Jackie, <clears throat> he's a cool guy. 
um, he's got a much higher voice. And they said they wanted him kind of young and kind of cocky and brash. And that they want him to kind of have a higher voice. So he's like, um, you look like you're moving in slow motion. Yeah, kind of thing. So he's always uh, got a lot of energy. So he's fun. And then we did uh, Lynn and I, I'm Lisa, I'm sorry, Lisa and I, uh, she's my sister, uh, Sarah Bryant, in the story. And very good friend of mine. You should interview her. She's amazing. And uh, so her, she's my, she's Sarah Bryant. So we got called to do this retrospective thing. The, 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 the five games, she did one, three, and five. I did two and four. And then that was just on a couple weeks ago um, to kind of kick off the uh, new Virtua Fighter uh, Ultimate Showdown or Final Showdown. What was it? Uh, the new game that just came out for Virtual Fighter. And so that was fun doing Jackie's voices again because I hadn't been Jackie in a long time. And so it was kind of fun to kind of, you know, let him out to play. So that was good. You were also in another fighter, which was uh, Tekken as, um, as uh, Paul. Um, did Jackie sort of inspire the sort of performance or was it a completely different take that you were trying to do? A uh, completely different type. I think... Uh, you know, there are different fighters, there are different characters, they have different styles. Um, to me, I think of Jackie as more of like an Ali as a boxer. You know, he's, he's big on combos and things. And then I think of Paul Phoenix as just like a puncher, like a Frazier. And he's just big, huge body blows. And so their fighting style is so different. And their, their character is just different, I felt. Um, and Paul is just like, you know, I'm the strongest in the universe. No, no pain, no gain. You know, and so he's just this big brawling kind of guy. Where Jackie's like, come on, yeah. So there's, there's kind of a, they're very different to me. But um, it's, it's still a fighting game, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it's still a lot of exertion sounds. It's kind of the main thing. So not a lot of dialogue with, like with Shenmue. So kind of very different game kind of narration. And which one do you sort of prefer, the long narration or just the, um, the, uh, the little <laughs> <laughs> Personally, <laughs> which one do you prefer? <clears throat> well, I think everybody prefers doing more work, you know, because that's what we're here for and that's what's fun <clears throat> and it pays the bills. And, you know, that's so it's always nice when you're in the studio longer and <clears throat> just as an actor, as a voice actor you definitely prefer uh, more depth of character. You know, a character that's fleshed out a bit more. Um, and luckily, I had three really different, interesting characters in Shenmue 1 and 2. So that was a lot more fun. Um, I like Jackie. I like Tekken. I like, you know, um, Captain Falcon, you know, all the different guys like that. But they don't have as many lines and you don't really see the character develop as much. So the, the more character, the more lines you have, the more fun it is as an actor. And uh, speaking about Captain Falcon, that was the first thing I, rem I remember hearing from you was that voice that you did in F-Zero GX. Uh, talk to me about getting that role and what it was like doing such a role as Captain Falcon. Well, he's a very different character than I've done in other games. Because he's the classic, you know, good guy. I get I, a lot of times I play the bad guys, um, which is really fun. But uh, it was kind of fun to play a good guy, you know. And you just have to put on your kind of good guy voice, and pretend like you're kind of like an old cowboy or something. You're the sheriff in town, and I'm going to clean this up. And uh, so he was fun to play. So I, I'll get you yet, Black Falcon, Black whatever guy was, or I forget the guy's name. The, the ears, Black Shadow. <laughs> Black Shadow, like, I'll get you yet, Black Shadow, you know? And so that was fun to play, like, the classic Superman kind of good guy, you know? And uh, so that was fun. I like it. And I, I like Captain Falcon. And I played his his brother, uh, Blood Falcon, as well. <clears throat> so I just had to use more of a bad guy voice. Yeah, and he had a, a much different voice. It was like a higher-pitched sort of voice, I remember... Blood Falcon having because he's sort of like right. a copy of Falcon, <laughs> copy from right, his DNA. Right, and um, you know, Blue Falcon was kind of cool all the time. He was just kind of lower and kind of cool, 
But Blood Fuck was a little bit kind of crazy, too, so he got a little higher base. And uh, not only did you do uh, video games as well, you've also done sort of a theme park rides, I believe. Uh, one of them was doing the voice of uh, Woody Woodpecker. So how did you uh, sort of uh, do such a crazier, higher-pitched character like that? Well, um, <clears throat> Japan, uh, what was it? Universal Studios Japan in Osaka opened up about, gosh, about 15 years ago now. And um, they had like a video game that they were using. And they wanted to use the voice in some of the, uh, uh, just when you're entering the park or doing something, <clears throat> just to have Woody Woodpecker say a few things. So I just read about, you know, 20 different lines for that. And it was like, <laughs> I can't even do it anyway. <laughs> you are now entering Universal Studios Japan. <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of this kind of voice. So he was, it was fun. I kind of watched old, you know, Woody Woodpecker cartoons and kind of found it. He was kind of a bad guy sometimes, you know, in the cartoons, but um, they wanted to clean him up a bit. So he wasn't, as, as rough as the cartoons. Did you feel that that was executed well when they changed somewhat his personality to be a little more friendly and less evil? Yeah, it, it was okay. You, you know, every job has to match the audience, basically. <clears throat> so um, their audience was a bunch of little kids in Japan who had never seen Woody Woodpecker before anyway. So it didn't really matter that it was changed. Yeah. <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. Uh, speaking of games, actually, um, have you played any of the video games that you're in? If so, which one? What do you think of all of them? Yeah, I've I've never been a gamer. I don't even like card games or board games or any kind of games at all. So I was never really inspired as a, even as a kid to play video games. And I'm also I'm, I'm a bit too old. So like when I was in high school, I remember Pong came out like. Boop, boop. Uh, you know, and uh, I think when I was like 16 or 17, you know, Space Invaders came out and Asteroids. So <clears throat> it wasn't really the kind of role playing really in, you know, in world characters that you get nowadays. There was no shooting or anything. And uh, then I was in university. And I think Pac-Man came out, you know, so it wasn't quite the same games that you have today. And I just never got hooked. Like I said, I was never a gamer. <clears throat> and I've never been really into gaming. I actually don't know any voice actors who actually play video games. Um, <clears throat> it's mostly just like a job. Interesting. But we all love the video games. We just don't play them. And I, I love watching them. I love watching other people play. If I try to play, I'm, I'm dead like that. I, it would just be boring because I'd be dying constantly. But... Um, <laughs> I've, I've watched people play, and I like seeing my voice. I like seeing my characters that I do do well and play and, and fight, and, and I like to see it. Um, I don't always like hearing my own voice or watching myself on, you know, I've, I've like done uh, TV shows and things like that. I, don't, I never watch. Um, but I do like seeing other people play and seeing other people really enjoy playing. And I'm always so amazed by the quality of the graphics and the design and uh everything that just blows me away you know especially like when you know suzuki yusan first came out um with like virtua fighter and Shenmu and things like that and those engines and the things he was doing was just groundbreaking you know nobody ever had ever done that kind of 3d kind of fighting games before and the in-world kind of experience before so that was amazing. I mean, although I didn't play the games, I still saw a lot of other people play and saw a lot of footage of it and blows me away always. And every time new games come out, there's new technology that's just amazing. So I like video games. I just don't like pushing the buttons. And how, will you ever sort of consider pushing the buttons at, a, at an eventual date just to sort of go, ah, oh, what the hell, try it? <laughs> uh, the only time I've ever played one of my characters it was like 25 years ago, and it was in an arcade in Japan, and I had just done either Virtua Fighter or Tekken. I don't remember which one. 
and I was walking past an arcade and I saw <clears throat> my game. And so I thought, oh, screw it. I've never played one of my games before, so I'll just check it out. So I put in 100 yen. <clears throat> it's like a buck. And, uh, and I chose my character. And it's like, ready, fight. And I went, cha, cha, sh, boom, boom, boom. I was like, dead. Immediately. Like, <laughs> dead. Game over. Well, that's it. I'm, you know. <clears throat> but I, I got to hear my voice. <clears throat> Even though it was very loud, all the, you know, ching, 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 all the games going and everything. I got to hear a little bit of like, come on, or something. And I'm like, oh, that's me. So I got to actually hear my voice once in an arcade. And I felt really happy. I felt kind of proud, you know. Uh, but that's all I wanted to do. I, I, I really wasn't interested in actually playing it. I just wanted to hear my voice. It was just vanity. <laughs> Getting off of games for a moment, uh, I want to speak about um, your various work for the NHK. Um, you're doing an educational sort of thing at the moment. I remember hearing that somewhere. Yeah, over the past <clears throat> like 25 years, I've been a lot of educational programs for NHK and, and a lot of documentaries and, and movie dubbing and things like that. They were my sponsor for about 10 years for my visa. And um, they're kind of like BBC. So they're the National Broadcasting uh, Corporation of Japan. Uh, currently, for the past about five or six years, uh, I've been doing a program that's really fun. It's called Ego de Asabo with Orton. And Orton is a whale. It's an animated whale, and uh, Orton Town is on his back where everybody lives in Orton Town. And Ego de Asabo means play with English. So it's play with English with Orton. And I'm the voice of Orton. And so it's kind of like Sesame Street in a way. It's for little kids teaching them English. And it's really fun. It's really well done. And so I'm, I'm Orton. And I say like, hi, I'm Orton. Today, we're going to talk about food or something. And the little kids, if they, get, if they have a problem, they say, hey, Orton. And I'm like, hi, how can I help you? you know? And so it's really fun and it's cute. And the kids are really cool. And, uh, and they do good work. You know, they, they, they make kids comfortable with English and with foreigners. And uh, it's real popular. It's on every morning and every afternoon. Um, so that's fun. And you've done a uh, movie dubbing for them as well. What sort of movies have uh, you dubbed in? Anything I know? <laughs> um, no, nothing. Just stuff in Japan. Um, a lot of it's just straight to video. A lot of stuff. A lot of it is, is company made films and things like that, <clears throat> which are more like videos, I guess. Um, but no big movies. Uh, for movies that are released, um, like in america or in england or something uh they would use voice talent in those countries to dub it so they don't dub it here first for foreign they send it to the foreign countries and then they dub it there if they dub oh <clears throat> tv shows i've done for example do you know um really popular iron chef iron <laughs> chef it sounds recognizable i don't know where i recognize it from but it sounds like yeah, about 25 years ago, 20 years ago, um, the original Japanese Iron Chef program is when you have these battles between these different chefs. And they say, okay, today's dish is <clears throat> lobster or something. And they're like, mm. go, go. <clears throat> and they run and they get all the stuff. <clears throat> and they have to cook several dishes in, a, in an allotted time. Um, and then the tasters taste them afterwards. So I was Iron Chef Morimoto, and I was a couple of the regular tasters as well. <clears throat> and this kind of gave birth to dozens of other like competitive cooking shows where they put different cooks you know, together, and this is your ingredients, and go. And you have to cook a dish by this certain time, and then the tasters taste it, and who's the winner? <clears throat> Iron Chef was the first... <coughs> excuse me. Iron Chef was the first show to ever do that. And so they have like American Iron Chef, Spanish Iron Chef, English Iron Chef. They have all these different takeoff versions of it. So I did, for about five years, I did the uh, voiceover they, the, of the Japanese show. I did the voiceover of an English. So that can be shown international. And uh, 
it was a really fun show. I learned, I love cooking. So that was great for me. I learned a lot about cooking and, um, we, every year <clears throat> there's like iron chef, Chinese, Chinese iron chef, Japanese iron chef, um, Italian iron chef, French iron chef. And every year the voice actors, there were about eight of us. We got to go to one of the iron chefs restaurant at the end of the year for a free dinner with a backstage tour of the kitchen and meet the chef and everything. So that was really fun. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I liked it. I remember my sister one time, <clears throat> she was at a hotel in Mexico. Excuse me. I think she was at a hotel in Mexico. <clears throat> she was brushing her teeth and they had the TV on and um, they were watching Iron Chef. And she didn't know I was doing that show. And um, my, I was doing the voice of the chef, I think Morimoto-san or something. And he was saying like, well, you know, you have to uh, put the lobster in cold water first to really, you know, before you take the shell off. So, it can, you know, it's something explaining about how he's cooking something. And she's brushing her teeth and she just heard it in the background. She's like, that's my brother. And she just heard by like the tone of my voice or something. That or it was a taster saying, This is delicious, or, you know, something. And she said, That's my brother. And it turned out it was me. And she had no idea I was doing it. So it was a really popular show. Some guy in Sweden I was talking to one time at a bar. And he says, I've heard your voice before. And we figured out it was from the Iron Chef show he saw in Sweden or something. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> um, and getting off the uh, voiceover work for a little bit, I want to speak about your book that you wrote. I am so getting this tonight because <laughs> I read a bit of it from what I've seen and it looks brilliant. It's called Ericisms, Thoughts and Life That Spill Out of My Mouth from Time to Time. Um, what sort of inspired that book and uh, what was the process of making it? Sometimes, especially if I'm out drinking with friends or something, <clears throat> I'll just say an idea that comes into my head, <clears throat> just a life observation or, you know, my two bits on philosophy or something. And uh, I've had people say, you should write that down. You know, and, and friends started saying, oh, that's another Ericism. <clears throat> and uh, so eventually I did. <clears throat> I started writing them down over about like 15 years. And then when I got an iPhone, I would type it in kind of thing. But usually it was like <clears throat> just something I say over drinks or I say in my head sometimes. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, okay. And they're all just like two or three lines, really short. They're almost like a little haiku or something. But um, I started writing them down. And finally, I was clearing out my desk about five years ago. And I found all these little pieces of paper <clears throat> with all these little stupid little bits of my mind on them. And uh, I thought, well, I should do something with these. So I decided to put them in a book. I think I have it. Hold on. <clears throat> yeah. Again, just recent, another interview was. Ah, there it is. So they're just, it's like a picture of California somewhere that I've lived or been. And then that's the, uh, the Ericisms in there. They're all real short with um japanese as well <clears throat> <clears throat> so a friend of mine translated the japanese <clears throat> so you can read it in english or in japanese and i was using it and i was giving it to the students and and different people and so i just self-published on amazon it's like seven bucks it's a good toilet read it's a good stocking stuffer you know, it's, it's nothing serious or deep or anything, but just fun little <clears throat> bits. The first chapter is called Sun, which is kind of the happy, humorous ones. The second chapter is called Wind, which is different ways of looking things that change. And then the third one is called Rain, that talks a little bit about loss or death or, or sadness or, or weakness or something like that, but in a positive way. Because, you know, rain, rain is hard, but it makes things grow. So that's cool um so a bit corny in that way but uh <clears throat> yeah it's fun it's just something that you can pick up and put down and if you can't think of something to buy some somebody it just seven bucks just throw them in the book <laughs> it's easy 
And uh, will there ever be like an Ericisms too? Because it seems to be something that you've been, you seem to make those Ericisms quite a bit. I used to make them more than I do nowadays, but I, uh, I put a hundred into the first book and then I had another 70. <clears throat> Some of them I didn't put in the first book um, because they were kind of riffing on religion and stuff a bit. And <clears throat> they're a bit harsher. And my mom said, I, I like your book and I want to I want to send it to friends, but I, I can't do it. The ones about religion, I just I can't support that. And, and it's kind of hurts me. And, you know, and so I'm like, OK, mom, I'll, I'll cut the, the religious you know, rap on, on that <clears throat> on the first in the first book. And so um, I have 70 more that are <clears throat> Ericisms, but plus the little harsher ones that I didn't put on the first one. I was going to put in the second one, um, but I just haven't got around to it yet. And I was going to call it Ericisms Spilling Harder. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I will look forward to that as well whenever that comes out. <laughs> the title has already sold me. <laughs> um, you also did like a little short film. I had like a quick browse through it uh, last night. It was called An Echo on Route. So uh, talk to me about how that sort of came about. <laughs> yeah, I was going to put that up on my Twitter site these sometime soon. I just haven't got around to it. I think it's still on <clears throat> YouTube. There's part one and part two. <clears throat> They're like seven minutes each or something. The whole thing's like 15 minutes long. Um, I studied film in university. So that was a film that I wrote, produced, and, uh, and made with a crew of about 10 people. And it uh, took us six months. And it was just student film. And at that time, all we had was 16 millimeter film. There wasn't any real did you know good digital video or anything <clears throat> you know i actually had to go into a, like a, a closet with a, a dark bag and load the film by hand couldn't even look at it <clears throat> and learn how to do that and learn how to cut the negative and paste it together glue it together and everything <clears throat> so really uh down and dirty kind of you know combat filmmaking like they used to do and it was fun and so i i wrote it and, and made it and uh, won an award, you know, local award. And then that was it. And like three weeks later, after that was shown, I, I was in Japan. So that was like a senior kind of project. They did, I think the school did five, they picked five projects a year and then put everybody into those different, you, you found your crew and stuff. And mine was chosen as one of the projects. And that was it. So, you know. It was just, it was a, definitely a work of love. I mean, it's been, I've never worked as hard on anything in my life, but it was fun and it was mine, you know, it was my idea and I made it and I could see it on a screen, you know? And uh, so it's kind of nice to take a, uh, a project from start to finish and, and actually see it finish. So that was nice. A lot of things I start, but I never finish. <laughs> And uh, have you uh, looked at it recently? And if so, what do you think of uh, the film now? Because I know a lot of people where they'll look at something and then six months that they made and then six months later, they're like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, that's all. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I tend to be kind of hypercritical of myself. So I, I usually don't watch anything I do. <clears throat> but um, this one wasn't just me because it was a whole team of people. You know, and I had a crew of about six or seven people with about five other musicians and then about six other people in the cast. So everything was all original even the, and great soundtrack. I love the music on it. <clears throat> I had a lot of musician friends and they put a lot of work into it and they worked so hard. And my main actor was actually a professional mus musician and in the 60s, he had his own albums out and stuff. His name was Bobby Ray Henson. He's passed away now, but <clears throat> he uh, was an amazing actor. So it's always wonderful to watch him. Uh, he played with uh, The Doors and he played with Stephen Stills and Buffalo Springfield and, and um, <clears throat> some Donovan and some other people like that. He was a really good musician. 
and an amazing actor. So it's, I, was, I love watching the work that everybody did, you know, the music and his acting and, and the locations are, you know, kind of nostalgic because it was all shot in Santa Barbara where I went to school. And uh, I have a lot of good memories from making that. So watching that is always really fun. And I'm, I'm proud of it because, you know, we didn't have the best technology in those days, but I think we pulled off a decent looking film. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So I like watching it. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds really cool. And I'm glad that you still find, find enjoyment of it now, even though it's like the movie's almost 30 years old. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you also did um, a Japanese sort of anime called uh, Doraemon, which uh, probably only five people in Ireland are going to know. Doraemon. There, I didn't even get it right, <laughs> the name. Uh, you did that, so uh, what was it? <laughs> what was it? What was it? I'll let you pronounce it like. Doraemon is, uh, <clears throat> is, a, is a very, very popular animated series in Japan. And it's about a uh, little blue robot from space. <clears throat> and he looks like a cat. Um, and he can create different things that he uses with his space powers and stuff. And he lives with a family, and he's like their pet. And it's a traditional Japanese family with the kids and the mom and the dad, kind of like a sitcom. And they have their different adventures. It's called the Adventures of Doraemon, kind of thing. And, um, and he talks like this, Doraemon. And they have like, he can make a door anywhere and go anywhere in the world. <clears throat> and it's called, in Japanese, it's called Doku Demo Door. But in English, it's anywhere door. So he's like, anywhere door. Come on, let's go. <clears throat> and so it's a, it was really popular. And we did the English version uh, for a company called Gakken, who specializes in this, um, educational uh, films and videos and things. So they kind of turned that series into a study tool as well. So people can <clears throat> watch it in Japanese or they can choose to watch it in English if they would like to study and that was mostly released in Japan. I think they released it <clears throat> a whole new version just a couple, a few years later or a few years ago, um, and they revoiced everything again in English. Yeah. In fact, actually, how much Japanese do you know? Because now you're here almost um, a couple of years now. So uh, how how uh, how much Japanese do you know? Well, I've been here 35 years. I came when I was 23. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm 58. Um, so I've lived in Japan most of my life. Um, I never studied. <clears throat> excuse me. I was only planning on being here two years. So I didn't really feel like I wanted to study. I just kind of wanted to work. And, and I kind of wanted to see like what it would be like to learn as a baby. Like how does it, because children don't study English. They just kind of learn any language. And so I just wanted to see, like, no reading, no writing, no dictionary. I just wanted to see as a survival kind of experiment, like, how I could learn to communicate. And so I did. And so two years, you know, and I was learning, you know, I could, <clears throat> a lot of base Japanese is pretty easy for basic spoken language. You know, the writing and the reading, they have three different written languages, right? So that's hard. And then if you have to learn about the honorific kind of language you have for, you know, people above you or people below you, or there's women, there's men, there's different levels of that language as well. Um, but if you're just trying to, you know, order a beer or, or take a train or, you know, or chat up a girl or something, there's, uh, <laughs> there's, <clears throat> it's, it's fairly simple. So I just learned what I needed to learn. And, um, you know, and then make friends and, and do well at, at, at my job and everything. And it was going well. So I never kind of felt like I needed to study. And then that became a bad habit. And I wish I would have studied when I first came. Um, but I got in the bad habit of just getting by on what I knew, which I was getting by well enough. And, you know, the old adage that good is the enemy of great. And so... I was satisfied with good. And so I speak 
my my Japanese is good. <laughs> it's not great, <laughs> but I can communicate, and um, and and I kind of like not understanding everything in a way. It kind of keeps me humble and it makes me patient, and um, it's it's kind of good to feel weak. I think in a way sometimes. Um, it's been a good philosophical lesson. And uh, I'm not much of a talker anyway. I'm not very social. So I don't even speak to people in English who speak English. You know, I, I never was very social when I lived in America. I'm never, you know, I don't really like hanging out and chatting with friends or going to parties or anything anyway. So even in English, I don't really like talking that much. So I don't miss it in Japanese. You know. Well, for someone who's not social, uh, you, this is one of the longest interviews I've ever done. <laughs> oh, really? Wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, just done, I've done so many of these that I kind of just have my pat things I say. So, Sorry, I've just got to rifle it off. Next question. <laughs> ah, sure. It's great. It's great. The longer, the better. Um, and um, what is the best part about Japan, actually? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it has to match you. You know, like any place. Um, it's peaceful. It's safe. It's quiet. It's polite. Um, it's, it's a foreign country, which is the best thing for me. <clears throat> I love living in another country. Because, you know, when you go on vacation and it's all everything, wow, what's that? Hey, that's new. I, I'm trying that. That's great. This is fun. I get to do that every day. And so, you know, as long as I've been in Japan, I'm still learning new things. And it's still a challenge. And I like to be alone. You know, I like being alone. I'm not a group or team kind of person. I'm not patriotic at all. I don't have any religion. And so I can, I can really just be completely alone and independent in a foreign country. And Japan especially because um, I don't even look like other people. So that's kind of cool. I can just disappear in a way. I stand out so I'm like a ghost. <clears throat> I know it doesn't make much sense. But one of my Ericisms is there's no place so wonderfully um, free as, um, as a country of, as a foreign country of four, 14 million people kind of thing. You know, I'm, I'm surrounded by 14 million people every day but I feel so open and so free and so alone because I'm a foreigner. And so it's, it's really good. And Japan especially is wonderful. The food, oh God, just for the food alone, you got to come. And the people are nice. You know, they're not the friendliest. Hey, how you doing? Give me a hug. They're not like that, but I don't always like that anyway. So they're a bit robotic and a bit quiet and shy. But uh, so some people don't like that part of it. But they're nice. You know, people are nice. The food is good. It's safe. Everything's clean. The trains run on time. You know, it's, it's a pretty easy place to live. And um, my fiance, Tomoyo, is Japanese and she's wonderful. And I have a, a lot of Japanese friends and things. And Japan's been very good to me. Japan welcomed me, you know, when I knew nothing and gave me a lot of opportunities. And so I appreciate that as well. That's a great answer. Well, I, I'm. I hope to get to Japan at least once in my life. So uh, that's a good bit of an idea of uh, what what I should do there. Yeah, first drink is on me. Try some food at. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And um, have there been any other interesting projects that um, you've been in, whether it be educational games, whatnot? Hmm. <clears throat> it's just a kind of the collection of everything it's games animation promotion videos documentaries i learned a lot from making documentary voicing over documentaries for nhk <clears throat> about you know different cultures or science or medicine or something that's always interesting so i've learned a lot um you know sometimes i have to voice over something for a medical company that's an international promotion video or something talking about <clears throat> some new treatment or or uh, medicine or something and I'm like, oh, shit, fuck, that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that, you know? Once I had to do a long video on how a post office works, 
And, you know, I don't think anybody really knows how a post office works. We just put a letter in the box and it comes back to us. Something else comes back to us, you know? <clears throat> and I'm like, shit, I had no idea. That's how a post office works. That's really interesting. And so a lot of things like that, I'm always learning something. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. Just, I guess the variety is really nice. What is your favorite thing to do in the summer? Now the summer's here. Summer in Japan is, is nasty. It's really humid. And right now we're in the rainy season portion of the summer. So you can't really do anything because it's raining every day. But I don't mind. I kind of like it. Um, <clears throat> but the, uh, the humidity is tough. But I do like being able to wear just shorts and a t-shirt and sandals and walk around town. Um, Eating, there's a lot of like outdoor yakitori places where you can sit outside and yakitori is uh, little bits of chicken on a stick, kind of like a shish kebab, like a mini shish kebab. <clears throat> and they do it over the thing and you order it. And uh, you get many different kinds of chicken related stuff. So sitting outside on kind of a hot summer day, eating yakitori, drinking beer or oolong hai, And uh, just hanging out with friends doing that is very summertime in Japan, which is always really nice. Describe the feeling of being attacked by a flying cockroach. <laughs> it's happened. It's a, it's a shock. Um, for a lot of people, I found Japanese are especially scared of cockroaches. So many people have like a cockroach phobia in Japan. And so when they do fly, they don't fly very often. But when they do fly and you get hit, it's, it's a shocker. Yeah, it's like an alien. <laughs> and do you think the phobia for cockroaches in Japan is bigger than like a phobia in spiders? I think there are more cockroaches than spiders. And, co and spiders, spiders just kind of crawl around and go places. But cockroaches are these little alien tanks that just crawl across your floor that you can't even kill. You just step on them and they don't die. They're just, they're just nasty. They're from hell. Which one's better, Disney or Pixar? Well, I think they're both Disney now. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> the genius of Disney is if there's a competitor who's doing something as well as you or even better, which Pixar does, I think, or did, still does. Um, I, I'm, I'm a fan of Pixar over Disney for sure. But, um, you know, instead of competing, Dixie, Dixie, <laughs> Dixie, Disney just buys it. You know, so they'll just buy the competitor and just that's brilliant. You know, just like a giant fish that just eats all the other fish. And uh, finally, what is your favorite character to have ever played as? as? I would have to say Ren because he had the most lines and he was kind of a wild card. And he was just like, <laughs> you know, he just had a lot of fun. And uh, he started off as just, you know, money grubbing kind of guy, like, I smell money, you know. And then he ended up becoming friends with Rio and had his back. And, uh, you know, I think he has some character development. So that's always fun to play when you're an actor, too. So, uh, Eric, great to have you on. Is there any final words you'd like to say? Nothing much. Uh, new Virtual Fighter just came out. Enjoy playing that. I'm um, looking forward to uh, Shenmue 4 someday. Hopefully, I'll get back into that one. I wasn't in Shenmue 3, but that's okay. <clears throat> Disappointed, but not angry or anything. That's how it goes, you know. Play, players always, voices always re replaced. I replaced other people. I was replaced, you know. So that's the nature of the beast. But um, that would be fun. Uh, yeah, I'd play hard, enjoy, you know, this whole COVID thing is kind of a bitch, but, um, hopefully it'll be done soon and everybody can uh, get back to their normal crazy lives and, uh, have fun. So thank you. And thank you for having me. I, I really had a good time. Good to meet you. All right. Well, Eric, thank you very much for coming onto the show and, uh, yeah, uh, speak to you soon. Okay, buddy. And if you ever come to Japan, you gotta let me know. First drink is on me, and uh, I'll, I'll show you around. We'll have fun.